Good morning. It's great to be with you, and uh, thank you, Pastor Dave, for the invitation, and uh, to see what God is doing here in uh, Hong Kong. Oh, Jakarta. We're in Jakarta. Uh, my wife, Sandy, is with me. Uh, Sandy, would you please stand and let everybody see you? Uh, as Pastor said, we have the opportunity to uh, travel uh, to all the different continents and many different countries of the world. Uh, from the United States, we send out about 2,660 or 70 personnel into about 190, 191 different countries. And uh, we have the opportunity to see uh, in a strategic macro way of what God is doing. And it, it's so cool to see what God is doing here amongst you here in Jakarta, and I, I just rejoice and we rejoice in our spirit. I want to tell you a, a, a little story. Of, it's a, I hate when they say this, but I guess I have to say it's a true story. Uh, a story about what is happening in uh, another part of the world. It's in, uh, uh, in the area of the Ukraine. Many of you have seen the headlines and seen what's going on there, and uh, the catalyst for uh, that event has been the Crimean Peninsula. Now, on the Crimean Peninsula, there live uh, Russians and there live Ukrainians, but there's also a, a small group of people, about three or four or five million people, that, uh, that are called the Tatars. And the Tatars are uh, a people that do not have a Christian heritage, do not know who Jesus Christ did, uh, as far as we knew a couple of years ago, there were no churches or no known believers there, or very few believers. And so several years ago, uh, several of our personnel had a real burden for the Crimean Peninsula, and particularly the Tata people. And uh, they began praying uh, and, and interceding for them, just like we interceded today for Tokyo, and, uh, and praying that God would do a, a good work there. And uh, how many know that when we start praying, God moves his hands sometimes behind the scenes, and we don't get to see what he's doing, but God is at work. And, uh, well, God was at work, and here's how, here's how the story develops. There was a, a woman, not of the Christian faith, not even close to the Christian faith, and she was uh, very sick and was dying and was put into a hospital. It just so happened it was a Christian Orthodox hospital. And so she was there, and her husband came to visit her and uh, determined that she didn't have very long to live. That's what the doctor said. That's what the nurses said. So as, as is the custom there, he went out to family and friends and gathered some funds, some money, so that they could have a funeral. And so when he came back, he was fully expecting to see his wife in the bed with like a sheet over her, her head because she had died. But to his surprise, there she was standing at the end of the bed getting dressed. And he was kind of shocked, so he went out and got the nurses, and the nurses came in and, and said, what are you doing? And she said, well, I'm, I'm going home. And the nurses said, you can't go home. You're very, very sick. And she said, well, listen, very early this morning, the doctor came into the room and told me I was well and I could go home, so I'm getting dressed and I'm going to go home. They couldn't convince her otherwise, so she took her husband's arm. They started walking out into the hallway, and there on the, uh, on the wall of the hallway was a little picture of Jesus knocking at the door. I don't know if you've ever seen that picture. And, uh, and she looks, and she sees that, and she says, there's my doctor. And the nurses said, no, 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 no. That's not a doctor, that's Jesus. He's a person in our religion, in our history. She says, I'm telling you, that man was in my room this morning, said I'm well, and I'm going home. That is Dr. Jesus. And so, so she gets home. Now, the rest of the story is like this. She has a five-year-old little son that has never walked. So she just kind of utters a she didn't know it, but I uttered a prayer and said, Dr. Jesus, if you could help my son, please help him. Well, in the middle of the night, the husband wakes up because he thinks somebody's breaking into the house. But there, running up and down the steps, is their five-year-old little son, just healed by the power of Jesus. It's really, really cool. And uh, so here's what happens. Our personnel that have been praying, these people have had a revelation and an illumination of Jesus but, you know, sometimes revelation and illumination is not enough. 
when you're in the kingdom of God, you also need to be discipled. You need to be with other believers. You need to be in a congregation such as this. You need to be in a small group. You need to understand who Jesus is. So our personnel connected with them. They told them who Jesus really is. They became really solid believers. They started witnessing in their village and town and in a, in, in a, a people and a society where there was no known church and no known witness. Now there are 12 house churches and a whole bunch of believers and we give glory to God. Isn't that cool? I have so many stories like that to, to share with you, but now I have a story to tell when I go to other places in the world about IES and Jakarta and how you all love Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you are a wonderful witness in this city. God bless you. I want to share with you today uh, out of the book of Philippians in the New Testament, chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. Philippians chapter 1. 12 through 18, if you have your phone, your iPad, you may even have a real paper Bible with you. I'm not sure about that, but if you turn to that, we'll read it together. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has hap actually uh, served to the advance of the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard to everyone that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become Oh, confident in the Lord, and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition and not sincerely, supposing that they can they can cause trouble for me when, while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is in that every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, yes, I will rejoice, and I will continue to rejoice. Lord, I thank you for your word. It's awesome that we can read it, that we can understand it. I pray, Father, that that word that you've designated for this morning will find residence in our heart today. Lord, I pray for those that have come this morning carrying burdens, carrying cares, possibly in chains. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would use this message, Lord, to speak to their hearts, and I ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. In this passage, Paul refers to himself as an ambassador for Christ, an ambassador for Christ, and as we know, an ambassador is one who represents his or her country, designated by the government to go to another country and represent the interests, if in your case, to represent the interests of Indonesia. And so an ambassador is one who represents. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul calls us as believers in Jesus Christ ambassadors of Christ, ambassadors of the kingdom. So each of us, in our own way, in our own circle of influence, whether in our family or in our friends, are ambassadors for Jesus. Now, the unique thing about this passage is if you were to flip back in your Bible or scroll back in your uh, Bible on your phone or whatever, you would come to Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, also written by the Apostle Paul, in verse 20, Paul calls himself an ambassador in chains. An ambassador in chains. It's almost like an oxymoron to be an ambassador and yet say, I am in chains. Because when you think about an ambassador, you think about authority, you think about somebody in another place, you think about the freedom to move and to live and to do things. But when you say an ambassador in chains, it puts a whole different image in our mind. Now, in the New Testament, there are three words that are used for chains in the Greek language. The first one is uh, desmios, and that means like a shackle. And a shackle would be something where you, you've seen like on the movies of Pirates of the Caribbean or something. They put them in shackles and then put them at the bottom of the boat. A second word would be desmos, which would mean something in bonds, like somebody would tie you up in, in bonds around your wrists. And the third one is called hallucis, and it's like a fetter. Or in our modern day terminology, it would be like, um, it would be like handcuffs. You know, do you have handcuffs here in Indonesia, in Jakarta? 
How many have ever been in handcuffs? Don't, don't raise your hand. That's what Paul is talking about in this passage of Scripture. He's talking about those handcuffs because he, as he said, he was chained to a guard. He was chained to a guard. Now, let's transfer those physical chains up through the centuries to the 21st century to us today. There may, we may not have physical chains on us, but there may be other chains that would want to bind us, that would want to hold us, that would want to handcuff us so that we couldn't be an effective ambassador. You say, what kind of change would that be? Well, fear. Fear would be like a chain that would want to hinder us or bind us from doing or being who God wants us to be. And it would be, uh, you know, we could talk about different kinds of fears. I personally don't like spiders. I don't like snakes. I don't like piranhas. I don't like anacondas. You know, you know there are several things that cause me certain fear. Uh, there could be fear of failure. You know, fear of failure is like maybe you're in the university or you're in school and you're just closing down the school year or the semester and you're going to have a test or a, uh, a, a, a big test or whatever and you can have fear. Boy, what am I going to do about this thing? And it could almost freeze you up. And it's been known that sometimes students are so afraid of a test that they'll just freeze up, and even though they know the material, they can't even take it because of the fear. Or it could be fear of something else that would fear on the job, that, you know, you go to your, maybe, maybe last week or last month wasn't a very good week or a good month, and your boss is going to come in and hand you, well, in America, they hand you a pink slip, and that means adios, alvita saying goodbye. So there are different fears that would want to bind us, that would want to chain us to circumstances. Or maybe it's like language or speech. You know, many of us speak several different languages, but maybe we can't articulate ourselves in another language, just to like we would like to. Or our speech is hindered because of maybe something that happened when we were children, or uh, maybe there's a little stuttering, or there's just a blockage of being able to flow in our language. And so that... That would cause us to, to have fear and, and, and to be bound by a chain of not being able to express ourselves like we would like to. We may have the knowledge, we may have the content, but it just can't come out like we would like it to. Or how about the opposite of the fear of failure? How about the fear of success? You say, fear of success? Yeah. What if you're a salesman and you had a really good month and you just broke all the quotas and your name is written on the... Uh, on the board, and everybody's clapping, and you, hey, really going at it, and your boss is shaking your hand, then all of a sudden you realize you had a great month. What if I don't have another month? What if the next month I, I, I don't succeed? And, and all of a sudden that succeeding has placed you in, in bondage somehow, or perhaps back to the student theory, uh, university or high school or whatever, you had a really good test and all of a sudden everything's going along and then everybody expects you to do good all the time. And all of a sudden there's that fear of success. Or what about guilt? We Christians, a lot of us have a lot of guilt. We carry a lot of guilt because, oh, I could have done this or I should have done that or why didn't I do this? Why didn't I witness when I had the opportunity? Or why didn't I, I make a stand? Or why didn't I do this or that? And sometimes we carry guilt that can be like chains that would want to bind us. Or peer pressure. Peer pressure is one of those things that just is so hard in every society of the world. I was talking to Pastor Dave a little bit ago, and uh, we were talking about peer pressure, and I, I told him I saw an interview on television about a man uh, who was 106 years old. Anybody here 100 years old or older? No. That shows you about peer pressure, doesn't it? Uh, this journalist was interviewing this man, and uh, he said, what's, what's the greatest thing about being 106 years old? Now, here he is wrapped up in a blanket, can hardly speak, but really sharp mind. And without blinking an eye, the journalist asked him, what's the best thing about being 106? And without blinking an eye, he answered, no peer pressure. No peer pressure. 
Think about it. What about personality type? Personality type sometimes can hinder us. Sometimes we think, you know, I have two children, a daughter and a son. They're, they're grown. They have children. But when they were young and going to school, my, my daughter was more inhibited, kind of shy, and my son was very outgoing and very charismatic. And um, I remember my wife and I took him into uh, a school. It was a, a school in another language for the first time for him. And uh, he... Uh, he, we were there standing, my wife and I and my, my little, I think he was about seven years old, at the, seven or eight years old, maybe nine at the time. And, uh, and so we were waiting for the teacher, and all of a sudden the teacher comes in. He runs up to the teacher, sticks out his hand and says, hi, I'm Greg Mundus, who are you? I mean, that's how he approaches life. Other people approach life like put me in a corner and don't talk to me, you know, and just let me do my work and leave me alone. Different personality types, either way, would want to put chains on us. So Paul's chains were physical chains, but the chains that we may face in the 21st century may be those kinds of chains. But as we look back and reflect on what the Apostle Paul said in First Philippians, or Philippians here, Paul's chains did not restrict him. And the obvious question was and is, why not? Because you see, Paul said that, or in, in the book here, in Philippians, it says, the whole palace guard heard that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we have to ask ourselves, what's going on? Well, first of all, back in Ephesians, the previous book to Philippians, in chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul says and makes a, some, a statement that's very important. He says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Catch that? Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now, here he is in prison, in a Roman prison, in Caesar's household somewhere in the palace. He's put down into a corner, and he's with a guard chained to him. But Paul wasn't in prison by the Roman Empire. He says, I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Big difference. He wasn't let, letting the circumstances dictate to him who he was. He's saying, I am a prisoner of Christ. And if, as a prisoner, I have no rights. And Christ wants me here, so I'm here. So what happens in that context? Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, uses the opportunity to witness. So how, how does this happen? Well, use your imagination with me. It's not in the Scripture, but use your imagination with me. Paul is chained to a guard. He has, like, some handcuffs, and, and he, can't, he doesn't have any freedom, can't go anywhere. This guy's used to running around the Mediterranean and starting churches, performing miracles, and doing all these things, and he's chained to this guard. Well, what happens? Well, the guard can't be with him 24 hours a day, so there must be a changing of the guard. So, say every four hours a new guard comes. So a new guard comes, puts the, chain, or puts the handcuff on himself and puts it on Paul. And I can just imagine Paul saying, hi, my name is Paul. It used to be Saul. And let me tell you what happened. You see, I was on the road to Damascus. I was an incredible persecutor of the church of Jesus Christ. I hated the church. I hated believers. I hated Jesus Christ. I threw them in prison. I killed them. I condemned them. I did everything I could. And as I was on the road, there was this light that came from heaven, a voice, and it was Jesus Christ. And it said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then I fell off my, my ride. I was taken into uh, Damascus, and this disciple of Jesus came and talked to me and told me this story. The story is Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross to forgive me of my sins. He arose again from the dead to seal that. He ascended up into heaven, and he's waiting to come back. And I'm here to tell you this story about Jesus Christ. He can forgive you of your sins. He can give you new life, and he's here to do that right now. Do you want to accept Jesus as your Savior. Well, four hours later, a new guard comes. And can you imagine? The chain is on. He looks at him and says, hi, my name is Paul. Used to be Saul. Let me tell you the story. You see, I was on the road to Damascus. Four hours later, a new guard comes. 
Hey, how you doing? My name is Paul. Used to be Saul. This goes on and on at every changing of the guard. The Bible says in Philippians that the whole palace guard heard about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this palace guard wasn't just ordinary guards, what weren't ordinary soldiers. They were like the imperial guard. They were like the best of the best. And there would have been very little contact with Christian believers. But God used Paul in chains to share the gospel in a very unusual circumstance. Because you see, as I view it, as Paul said, I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. As Paul said it, I am an ambassador in chains. You see, the gar- Paul was not chained to the guard. The guard was chained to Paul. I had a friend in Madrid, Spain, that he was such an evangelist. He wanted to share the gospel with everybody. So what did he do? He got a guitar. It had strings on it, Pastor. He got a guitar, got into the subway, and in between stops there was three minutes. He had a captive audience. He hit that guitar, played one song, preached the gospel. People got out, new people got in. Three minutes, shared the gospel. You see, we are not chained to circumstances or context or to fears. They're chained to us. They're chained to us. And that's what Paul said. Now, this takes courage to understand that I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. It takes courage to say, I am an ambassador in chains. Now, what I'm talking about is not the chains we sang about earlier in the service. Those chains are the chains of sin. Those have been broken. Those have been destroyed by the blood of Jesus Christ. What I'm talking about are these circumstances, these fears, these things that come upon each of us. Acts chapter 4 verse 13 says this, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled and ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that they had been with Jesus. You see, when you're with Jesus, there's courage that comes. When you're with Jesus, courage will encourage others. And what happened, even though uh, Peter and John were before the Sanhedrin there, Their courage of standing up before this whole religious body encouraged all of the believers in Jerusalem, and they were able to share the gospel and to live their lives worth and for God. Now, you fast forward several hundred years, actually several centuries, uh, to a man by the name of Martin Luther. Martin Luther was in a religious system that demanded that you do works to get into heaven. Well, we know faith is not by works. Faith, the just shall live by faith, not by works. And uh, he stated this and came against a whole empire, a whole religious t- system. He, he pounded the nail in a thesis, 95 thesis on the Wittenberg door, and, and, and said, here I stand, I can do no other, God help me. Well, what happened? It changed the whole religious scenery over the period of the next several hundred years. Because one man stood up. Because courage evidences character. Courage evidences character. Now somebody said adversities don't make a man weak or strong. They only reveal who he is. Adversities don't make a man weak or strong. They reveal who he is. And so in that situation when Martin Luther was standing up against an empire, against a religious system, it evidenced the character that he had, that he stood by the principle and the biblical principle that the just shall live by faith. Someone said, if you falter in times of trouble, how small is your strength? That someone was Solomon in Proverbs chapter 24. And one other person said, if men can be found faithful in hard places, they can be trusted in high places. And courage is holding on five minutes longer. Just five minutes longer. I heard a story. <laughs> heard a story about two frogs. Now I asked the other congregations if there are frogs in Indonesia and they all said that there are frogs here. And um, um, I asked them what does a frog say? And nobody knew. 
Apparently, you have dumb frogs here. In America, frogs say ribbit. In Austria, where we lived, frogs say quark. What do frogs say here? Hoka. I think that's in the Philippines. <laughs> Two frogs were kind of jumping along, and they were minding their own business, having a great time. They didn't look where they were going, and they jumped right into a milk can. Now, the milk can, you know, is made of stainless steel, very slippery. Fortunately, there was milk in the milk can. And fortunately, as you know, frogs are amphibious, so they can swim. So when they hit that milk, they started swimming. And they started swimming round and round, and they were kicking, and they were swimming. So frog one says to frog two, keep swimming, keep kicking, don't give up. Frog two says to frog one, we're going nowhere. We're going around in circles. This is useless. But frog one says to frog two, don't give up. Hang on. Keep swimming. Keep kicking, because we got to keep going. And Frog 2 said, this is useless. And he gives up and blah, 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 blah. But Frog 1 starts speaking to himself. You ever spoke to yourself? Don't, don't move your lips when you do that. People think you're... <laughs> but Frog 1 says to himself, keep swimming, keep kicking, don't give up. Keep swimming, keep kicking, don't give up. Keep swimming, keep kicking, don't give up. And he keeps swimming and he keeps kicking and he doesn't give up. And pretty soon that milk is going round and round. And do you know what happens when milk goes round and round? It curdles and coagulates and becomes butter. The frog stands on the butter and jumps out of the can. Little lesson for us don't give up. Perhaps you're a new believer. Perhaps you've been in the faith for a little bit, but you're, there are some real circumstances that are hard on you and difficult. It's like chains. And what the Word is saying here, what Paul is saying here, don't give up. Don't give up. Hang on. You see, courage, courage evidences character. And if you are in touch with Jesus and your devotional life is in touch with Jesus and you're reading the Bible and the Holy Spirit is upon you, he will give you courage in the most difficult circumstances. And remember that you're not, you're not a prisoner of circumstances. You're not a prisoner of context. You're not a prisoner of fear. You're not a prisoner of any of these things. You are a prisoner of Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ. And he will help you and give you courage. I, I heard another story about uh, in England years ago in the 1800s when an atheist was giving a lecture, and it was in one of these uh, English halls, and there was like a, a main floor and two or three balconies, and he was just ranting and railing against God and about, uh, against Jesus, and, and he was very articulate, he was very crafty, he was very good in his logical argument, and he was very audacious and very bold in saying, if there's anyone here that can argue that there is a God, come up on this stage and I will argue with you. Well, everybody was afraid. There was like a fear that gripped the whole audience. Except up on the third balcony, there was a little girl that just couldn't take it anymore, and she stood up. And she started singing a very old hymn of the church. And that hymn is, Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Well, this one little girl stands up on the third balcony and starts singing that and repeats it. Well, pretty soon, several other join in. And then on the second level, and on the main level. And before you know it, most of the people in that hall were standing up singing that song. And the atheist lecturer walked off the stage because he couldn't say anything more. Why? Because one little girl had the courage to stand up. You see, people are waiting to see who will make a stand? Who will say what is right and make a stand for that right? And the world is waiting to see a witness from us that we will stand for Jesus Christ. I'm not saying it won't cost something. I'm saying that when we stand up for Jesus, it has incredible ramifications. Ramifications that we can't even know 
and understand of the ripples that go out through society, not only in our local family, but also in our area, in our city, in our country. So courage evidences character. God, give us the character. Give us the courage to stand up for you in the most difficult circumstances. And that comes from the attitude of saying, I am a prisoner, not of circumstances, not of context, but I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. The last thing I would like to share with you is I believe that courage emulates Jesus Christ. I believe that the most courageous step ever taken in the history of mankind is when God, Jesus, a member of the Trinity, like we sang this morning, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, when God the Son, Jesus Christ, became a human being as recorded in Philippians chapter two. He gave up all of heaven, gave up his infinity, gave up all of the knowledge, the universal knowledge that he had, gave up his omnipresence, gave that all up to be born as a human being, and not even as an adult, but came as a child, had to be taken care of. I believe that was the most courageous thing that could ever be done. And that is an example for us. I believe that as Jesus lived here on the earth, lived in Jerusalem and in Israel, that he stayed in Nazareth even after he got the revelation and understood at 12 years old that he was the son of God, that he argued in the temple and debated in the temple and his parents came and got him and said, what are you doing? He says, I'm about my father's business. But the Bible says he learned obedience and he had the courage to go back to Nazareth and subject himself to his parents until he was 30 years of age. That took a lot of guts, took a lot of courage. I believe it took a lot of courage for him to go to Jerusalem when he knew he was going to die there. It took a lot of courage when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he could have called 10,000 angels to come and to free him and protect him. But he denied all of that so that he could go to the cross and save us from our sins. That took courage. I believe it took courage to stand up to the Pharisees into a religious system. And that's what he did. He said, Sunday isn't for man, it's for God. And God sanctions Sunday. And we can, we can live for God on Sunday. We don't have to follow rules and all of these kinds of little things. I believe that Jesus is our great, our great model and that we can emulate him. So I ask myself, and I ask us today, are you bound by chains of circumstances? Are you bound by others' opinions of you? Are you bound by inward fears that would want to hinder you from being who God wants you to be and how God wants you to be and by doing what God wants you to do? Or are you overcoming these circumstances and overcoming others' opinions and overcoming fears and overcoming the peer pressures because you take courage in God? I believe God wants to encourage and give us courage even on this Sunday morning. John chapter 16, verse 33 says, Jesus speaking says, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Because Jesus overcame, we can overcome. Because Jesus had courage, we as his disciples, as his sons, as his daughters, can also have courage. Because Jesus saw a glimpse of heaven and knew that he was doing the will of the Father, we too can have a glimpse of heaven and know that we are doing the will of of the Father. Don't let circumstances put chains on you. Don't let fears put chains on you. Don't be a prisoner of these things. Be a prisoner of Jesus Christ.